Uh, how big is the team that you go with? Well, it depends. Uh, we, try to, we try to take, you know, Cowboys with us. A lot of folks are, whether working Cowboys or rodeo Cowboys. And so it's great out here because a lot of the guys and, and ladies, uh, you know, donate their time and they come out and spend time with us. So we'll typically take five or six people with us. It depends on the clinic. You know, a lot of times they don't, it, different rules, different right. places. So it right. depends on how big you can do that. But uh, it's amazing. The rodeo family and the Western culture and the Western world has been such a supportive family of that. And it's, it's the best thing I do. I mean, it's the greatest thing I do. We just came off of, we just came off of a, a comedy tour. We did 35 cities uh, this year. We were sponsored by Rank Rodeo Threads. It has a boot, booth over there on, what is that, aisle 600. And we did 35 cities, and every city we go to, we try to do these hospital visits. And we, we like to say we do, we do laughs at night and smiles in the daytime, you know. And it's the best thing we do. It's incredible meeting these families and these kids. Well, it's hard because one of our rules is you can't cry. Uh, if you go visit, you can't cry. And if you feel like you're going to cry, and trust me, I'm a crier. It, <laughs> shut up, Frank. <laughs> You got to leave the room, you know? And so, right. yeah, we spend a lot of time, you know, walking around going, I'm fine. I'm okay. It's sinus or hay fever, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. We have a few rules. That's the hardest one. No crying because, you know, I, and I have five kids. I have five kids. Um, yeah. I, I, I didn't know if I might need some spare family. parts or something. You know, one day I was like, come on, kid. We're going to the doctor. Daddy needs a liver, especially after being in Vegas. No, I... Uh, so, I, you know, I love kids. I love kids. And so I've got them from 19 down to 9. And, um, oh, uh, yes. so you, you understand the, the, the agony of a 19-year-old. I don't understand anything about a 19-year-old girl. <laughs> Nothing. No, I'm, I'm blessed with, with really great kids. And they've got a great value system. And they love the Lord. And, it's, you know, I, I, I don't know how I did it. I, right, I don't take right? any credit for how good my kids are. People are like, wow, you have the best children. And I'm like, I didn't do it. Exactly. I didn't no, I get a it. Thing to do well, with it. it was, <laughs> tell us a little bit about you know outside your comedy. What else you you, you were on ride? You were doing a show on ride. Tell yeah. us a little bit about your background. Well, so uh, I've I've always been on stage somewhere. Most of it was in the form of motivational speaking, and I worked with a lot of nonprofit organizations over the years, and uh, been literally all over the world numerous times for the last 25 years. And first time I was ever on TV, I was two years old. So I was just I've always had a microphone in front of me at some point in time. And, I know um, she held it right. I'm like, oh, he's got that figured yeah, out. Yeah, you got to get this thing right <laughs> into your mouth. These things, it's like eating an ice cream cone. You take it all the way to the elbow. <laughs> the, the, um, but so I did that, and then I, then I got into the corporate world for about five years with a Fortune 300 company. I was doing a lot of sales training and things like that, and I, it just wasn't where my heart was. And so I called my wife. I was actually at the gym. I was not in the gym. I was at the gym. I was... You don't go in. You and just you know check what? I in. found out the hard way that you can't get a membership just to watch. <laughs> they want you to do stuff in there, and I don't like doing stuff. So I was in the parking lot of the gym. I called my wife on the phone, and I said, babe, you know I've been depressed. You know I've been d just down. And I said, I, I got to quit this job. She said, whatever you need to do, I support that. And I said, that's great because I've already quit. And so <laughs> she said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I have a plan. I'm going to make a living just being myself. <laughs> Try saying that to your wife. <laughs> she said, Chad, what is the street value on your personality <laughs> these days? And I said, it's about like President, President Obama giving a keynote address at the NRA convention. It is hashtag worthless. So <laughs> she said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going um, to make a living on Facebook. And she said, so you're going to quit your job and give up your retirement for Facebook? I said, yeah. She said, you couldn't do that at night? <laughs> So, I mean, I basically said, you know, here's, here's my philosophy of life. Vision, passion, discipline, and risk. You got to have those four ingredients. You got to start with a vision where you see beyond your boundaries. That thing should get you up in the morning. That leads to passion. Passion is, is it's what drives you, you know. And I work harder today than I have ever worked in my life, but I love doing what I do, and the rewards are incredible. But you got to discipline yourself to make that success happen, and then you got to risk and that was a risk. That was a big risk for me to say, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to pursue this life that I want. And uh, it's been a real blessing. Well, and one thing I think is important to address because I know there's so many out there that do have passion and do have vision, but they get stomped on by people around them. And Well, that's going to happen. I mean, you know, you're, look, let's face it. You, everybody's got an opinion about something and, and we hold on to the negative so much. We were talking about that. You know, it, it's amazing. I can go through 
I, I get thousands of comments on a, on a video, and I can go through, and everybody's like, love the video, love this, love this, love these words, love what you do, love this. You're an idiot. I'm going to hang on to the idiot comment <laughs> all day long. True. Because deep down, I know I am, <laughs> and it registers in my soul. <laughs> my mother has always told me that I, <laughs> that's why I want Bob Jean to call her. <laughs> Well, that's so great that you're touching on that because how do you walk away from that negative? Because it, it really it's can hard. bring you down. It's hard. Well, first of all, so I'm 44, and it took me a long time to get comfortable in my own skin and, and get secure about who I am and not trying to be somebody else. Somebody a long time ago said that it's, it's impossible to wear two faces or two masks to the world without, before long, you forget which one is the real one you got to be yourself. And that's the thing. So many people. So a, a great illustration is this. You go read the Bible. In the Old Testament, King David was, he was a songwriter. And it, th there's, a, there's an obscure verse in Scripture that says that he actually created instruments to play. It's one thing, it's one thing to be able to play something, but to create an instrument that's never been made because you have this sound that you want to make, in music, but there's not an instrument, instrument that makes that sound, so you go out and create it. That's impressive. When you look at that, I think that we as individuals are instruments that God looked into the world and said, you know, I need to make a sound with a certain voice, and I don't have that instrument created yet. So I'm going to make you. I'm going right. to make us Sabrina, and, and she's going to make a certain sound in the world that nobody else can make. The problem Amen. is we're trying to make everybody else's sound, you know, and stop being an echo and be your own voice. And, and it's hard to do because everybody's going to criticize you for being yourself. But ultimately, that's the only way to live your life. Well, and I have to say, uh, you did well during the election, being yourself. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Was that a huge... I mean, that was a risk, t starting to talk about politics like yeah. you did and take the stand. Yeah. What made you decide to do it? Um, influence. I, you know, I, I, I love America. I, I, love, I love our military. I love our veterans. I love our police officers, our first responders, the folks that put on a uniform every day and risk their lives. And I think that they deserve the absolute best we can give them in terms of honor and respect. Uh, I think they, the financial support, the help, you know, whatever they need, I, we've got to do that. And so when I look at politics, I think, hey, here's an opportunity to make our country stronger for folks like that because they're the ones protecting us and taking care of us. So I have people all the time who say, don't talk about politics. Are you kidding me? I got five kids. This, influ this influences their future. This yep. matters. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I, and I want my kids to be outspoken about what they believe and, and what they know their values are. And so... I'm not going to shy away from it, even if it, you know, causes people to criticize me. I just know that even though I've done it and some people don't like it, the following keeps getting bigger and bigger, so I must be doing something. <laughs> right. You're, right. You're, doing, you're doing it right, yeah. definitely. So I'm and not worried about it. I mean, it's not like I count. I mean, we're only at 416,367,414 <laughs> views, but it's He's not, not like counting. I'm counting. He's not you know, I got counting. Kids, I got kids in Southeast Asia going, we look at that to Chad. Poke up. <laughs> Let me tell you, until you've been poked in Thailand, you haven't been poked. <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah, oh, yeah. Are you speechless? I only have, I only are you speechless? 61. But you didn't have a problem with them stealing from the recycled spoon. <laughs> no, I'm no, not that, speechless. That, that, I'm that, giving that, you that so Thailand. much business. Look at you. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Give her a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chad, you know, what you said is so very true because children learn what they live, and we have yeah. a responsibility to the younger generation, our children, and in my case, my grandson, your grandchildren, you know, your uh, children, and that is we need to take a stand, and we need to stand for something, or, you know, we stand for nothing at all. Well, and, you know, and I agree with you, because the whole concept of our show started from what the Lord told me to do, mm -hmm. and what Marie said, listen to Lord, what the Lord's telling you to do, and that was a risk, because you're talking about your faith, and wanting to make a platform, but you got to do what you got to do, and you got to follow your heart, and you got to follow your passion and you get honored in doing so. You do. You, that's the only way to be fulfilled. And you know, when I said vision, passion, discipline, and risk, you got to do it in that order because listen to this for a second. Let's take it backwards. Risk without discipline is recklessness. That's like jumping out of an airplane without having the discipline to make sure the parachute was packed right. So risk without discipline is recklessness. Discipline 
without passion is legalism. That's just rules and regulations. Nobody wants to live like that. Passion without vision is hype. That's just cheerleading. It gets you nothing. But vision without faith is meaningless. And not only faith in God, but faith in yourself, as we're talking about. You've got to believe that you can accomplish that vision, which is so big. You know, who knows? There could be a tornado outside right now. We don't know because our vision is closed in by these four walls. We can't see beyond our horizons. Vision is that ability to see that. And, you know, uh, July the 4th, 1776, key date in history. King George was in England. He wrote in his diary on that day, nothing important happened today. He didn't know that in the colonies across the Atlantic Ocean, a place that was under his rule and reign, independence had just been declared. Revolution had been broadcast towards him and said, hey, look, we're, we're taking this country away from you. But he didn't have the vision to see that far. He didn't have that. He didn't know for weeks, months that that had happened. And so that's our problem is we live not knowing that there's a huge horizon out there where your dreams can come true. That's so, you know, and that's so impressive. And I know we're almost out of time. We just got about a uh, couple minutes, but you two are very inspirational and I appreciate you guys. They're wonderful. And you, yes. everything you're speaking of, everything you've done is just a testament and, and what you've done with Make-A-Wish. Wow. I mean, I mean, it's, it's Thank speechless. You. I mean, you guys are out changing people's lives and you know you probably thought when chad came on you know the, again this is how the lord works you just never know where it's going to go and we just kind of let him lead you know depth roots history you know we love it and you being part of the western way of life which is something i need to ask you and chad before we end the show why the western way well, oh, there's a, I, I can't remember the 10 characteristics of Western life, the, the rules, but... The, Go to the West. <laughs> the, the biggest thing is, is uh, the Western way of life is the integrity, the, the I believe in country, God, mom, apple pie, always help the others. It, it's all about other people and not yourself. Love it. And Chad? Well, you know, historically, the cowboy culture really only lasted about five years in the 1800s. And... and the legacy of it, though, has lived on. Uh, in fact, the term cowboy wasn't even a popular, it, it was kind of an insult when you called somebody that uh, in those days. So um, that self-discipline, that self-respect, that respect for other people, that work ethic is something that, that by and large gets lost in today's culture, but we call that back. And that's what I want to do. You know, when I put on a, I, I wear a cowboy hat and I do my videos in the cowboy hat. I know this cowboy hat probably keeps me back from a lot of things because people immediately want to judge you when they see it. They don't understand that. But to me, it says that it is a lifestyle of, of work and ethics and values and respect. And that's what I want to honor. I love it. Give if, I can, if I can touch, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. If I can touch just quick on the cowboy hat, uh, you mentioned Ellis Island Medal of Honor. And they requested, because this is a black tie formal affair, they requested that I wear a cowboy hat just to show that culture. And then also I was a commencement speaker at Ohio State University uh, this past year. And again, a very formal ceremony, in fact, 19,000 people in the stadium, and the president requested that I wear the cowboy hat. He said you were the first one to ever wear a hat during the process, but they wanted to express that culture that that represents. Love so, it. Just Amen. what you're saying about the cowboy hat. Yeah. Well, well, give these two a round of applause. We're going to let them go, and thank you so much for being thank a part you. of our show today. Thank you.